air mass thunderstorms are probably the biggest challenge we face in summer flying. We're going to talk about why they form, some things that make them unpredictable, and things you can do to help avoid them. So an air mass thunderstorm is a thunderstorm that's not caused by a front or some other synoptic action. And it's kind of the thunderstorm that you would see just on any given day, oftentimes in the afternoon. We're going to talk about that in a second. But it still requires those three basic ingredients, right? We need some sort of lifting action, which we call forcing. Number two, you're going to need an unstable atmosphere, at least at some level. And then number three, you need moisture. Air mass thunderstorms, frontal thunderstorms, they all have the three basic ingredients. But when we talk about air mass thunderstorms, understanding that lifting action, that forcing, can help you understand where they're likely to form and routes that are likely to be clear. So the main cause of lifting action, the main forcing for an air mass thunderstorm is a thermal. And this is one of the reasons they tend to show up in the afternoon. So we've already talked about the fact that the sun heats the Earth's surface, or at least provides energy to the Earth's surface, which then in turn heats the air above it. And that's what's going to trigger those thermals. Obviously, they're more likely to form in the afternoon, right? Because you've had a longer time to heat the air. The air's gotten warm enough that it's starting to rise. Eventually, it separates from the surface and it starts to bubble up. And that thermal is one of the main causes for lifting action. It'll rise up far enough to where it condenses out some moisture, that instability will increase, and now it shoots up into a thunderstorm. So again, that thermal is our main lifting action for an air mass thunderstorm. Now, the other thing we need is instability. And when you think about that cycle of temperatures, right? Overnight, the surface of the earth is cooling the air. So we end up with either a fairly vertical temperature profile where the temperature doesn't decrease much at all as we go up, or in some places, especially places like mountain valleys, you end up with an overnight inversion where the ground is actually cooler than the air aloft. So that stability in the morning often prevents any chance of a thunderstorm from forming. But then as the day goes on, the surface of the earth is starting to heat up the air above it, and that's going to swing that temperature gradient out. But as you go up in the atmosphere, eventually high enough, it's not being warmed by the ground at all. So as you move into the afternoon, you end up with a more unstable temperature profile because the ground is heating the air above it. Okay, so those two reasons are why air mass thunderstorms are so much more common in the afternoon. And it makes sense that anything that's going to promote the development of a thermal will also promote the chance of an air mass thunderstorm as long as you still have an unstable atmosphere and some level of moisture. And when you think about ridge lines or mountains or large groups of hills, these are essentially thermal generators. That's what they do. Remember, it's the ground that's heating the air above it. And the more contact you have with the ground, the more ground there is, the more the air is going to warm up. And so think about those slopes on a hill or a ridgeline or a mountain. You've got a lot of surface contact to warm the air above it. As the air warms up, it starts to flow up the side of the mountain or the ridgeline. And we call this an upslope wind or upslope flow. Once it reaches the top, it converges, and then it rises up as one big massive thermal. We call this upslope flow convergence. We really dig into this in our mountain weather course because understanding this concept makes a massive difference in the weather that you'll choose to fly through. So if there's no moisture as you get into the afternoon flying over these ridge lines, you're just simply going to get turbulence as you fly through these massive thermals. But if you've got some moisture in the atmosphere, now they'll rise up enough where the air parcels expanded and cooled enough to the point where that cloud condenses out. And when you look at ridge lines in the summer, spring and fall too, you're going to see clouds that form over them predictably as you enter the early afternoon or the late morning. And then as that heating progresses, those clouds grow and grow and grow. And usually by mid-afternoon to late afternoon, they're at least showers. If there's enough instability, they become thunderstorms. And if you've got enough wind, they'll break off from the mountains and then blow out over the plains. And that drives the weather in so many cities that are downwind of a mountain range, even hundreds of miles downwind. 
And we see this all the time over our Colorado Rockies here. You can see these showers just forming over the ridge lines and sitting on top of our mountains because our steering winds or our winds aloft are not strong enough to blow them out over the plains or the plains just don't have the instability to keep those storms going as they move over there. And again, as a pilot, we don't need a full on thunderstorm to make this flight a no-go. These showers, they have enough super cooled liquid droplets to create significant clear ice, enough turbulence that makes it absolutely unsafe to fly through that area. And there's no way that you could safely fly below those clouds. A, they're too close to the mountains and B, the downdrafts that makes it impossible. And we see upslope flow convergence all the time when we're flying. So this is, I think, a perfect example. We're on our way out to Utah in the morning, and you can see we've got a very stable layer here near the surface, that stratus cloud deck showing us that we've got some moisture. But look at those little hills that are poking up above it. You can see how they've got those kind of puffy fair weather cumulus on top. That is upslope flow convergence. And honestly, this shows me two things. Number one, that there's moisture in the atmosphere. And number two, that we're getting enough lifting action off those hills to start to cause a small amount of convection. But I bet by the afternoon, that's gonna turn into enough convection that we would not be able to take this same route home. So when you think about route planning, planning routes that keep you away from the ridge lines in the afternoon can keep you away from the thunderstorms. Here we are in the Snake River Valley, flying back from Oregon on our way back to Colorado. And you can see that we've got the same convergence happening over the ridge lines, both south and north of our route of flight through the valley. And if you've ever been here, you'll see that this is a very common occurrence. The storms form on the ridge lines outside of the valley, and then in the afternoon, the winds start to blow those storms into the valley. So when you see this forming, expect these clouds to become towering cumulus and start thinking about where you're gonna get the airplane down. Somewhere that would be clear, and somewhere, ideally, where you could hanger the airplane in case you have hail. In this case, we were able to make it to Idaho Falls and no farther, but they had a great hangar. It was a great place to stop for the night. Next day, we saw the exact same thing flying through Wyoming in the morning. More upslope flow convergence, which told us, again, by mid-afternoon, things are going to be storming. And we were able to make it into Rocky Mountain Metro, basically in late morning, beating the storms. But again, the afternoon turned out just like we expected. Okay, so let's talk about two things that make air mass thunderstorms unpredictable. They're driven oftentimes, as I said, by thermals. So anything that stops that thermal formation can also delay or completely kill off air mass thunderstorms. And remember over Granby, I said we had this beautiful clear blue sky, lots of thermals because lots of incoming radiation. But if you've got a high altitude cirrus cloud layer, a cirrus shield, right? That can reflect enough energy back out into space that it delays the surface warming on the ground and either thermals are late, which delay thunderstorms, or they don't get big enough at all and you don't get any thunderstorms. So this is something that you can use when you're flying, especially if you got something like Sirius XM weather, you can see cloud layers out ahead of you. If you could see an area that's covered with a layer of clouds like a Cirrus shield in the morning, and then you see that area disappear that tells you that solar heating has really started to begin. And I would expect that storms might start to pop up in that area, even if they hadn't been there earlier in the day and they were forecast to occur. The other thing that can make these air mass thunderstorms unpredictable is a cap. So a cap is just simply an area of warm air aloft, usually several thousand feet above the ground. Because it's warm aloft, it just kills off the instability. So even if you get a thermal rising, once it reaches that warm air in the cap, the air is either warmer than the thermal itself or roughly the same temperature, and the thermal stops. So it basically stops that lifting action. The other thing, though, that a cap can do is it actually increases the heating of the air by the ground. So if you've got sun shining through this cap, right, you got this air by the ground getting very, very warm, and it could be evaporating out a lot of moisture on the ground as well, if you've got lakes or water on the ground. So a cap can actually kind of super warm up the air below it and increase its humidity. And then if that cap falls apart in the afternoon, 
that warm air and that humidity now has an immense amount of potential energy and can quickly rise through it. And this oftentimes is the driver for severe air mass thunderstorms. They develop under a cap. Now, a cap's not something that we're going to see typically in our forecasts, but you can find them in the area forecast discussion. We're going to talk about that in a different video. But when I know that there's a cap in place in an area and that cap is expected to break, I know that that area could go from completely clear to full of thunderstorms in essentially a matter of minutes. Okay, you could see that the terrain has a massive impact on the potential weather that could develop above it. And that's something we go into depth in in our mountain weather course. Because once you can read the terrain, you can identify routes that are not only to get you to your destination more reliably and obviously more safely, but also more comfortably. And that course, as well as all of our other courses, is 20% off through Thursday. One of the most common questions we have about our course is, how long do I have access? You've got lifetime access. It is a one-time purchase. Okay, now that we've talked about these principles, I'm going to put out a video in a bit that talks about how you can use forecasts to identify them on your basic electronic flight bag. And I know a lot of you live around areas where you're going to see weather like this. If you do, let me know how it impacts you in the comments down below. And last but not least, we've got another challenge. It talks about what we've covered in this video. You can take it for free on our iOS apps. There's a link for that down below as well.